Today, I'm gonna get lit. Well, by that I mean, we're gonna take a look inside the CFL bulb. I'm Rachel DeBarros, and we're gonna tear this down. So let's check out what we have here. This is just your average CFL bulb. I believe it's a 45 watt, and it comes from one of my studio lights where, where I was setting up, well, the whole thing, something hit it, and it just took a tumble. It just went pew right onto the floor, and I heard a crashing sound, so I opened it up expecting to find a ton of glass, but luckily, all I saw was this light bulb, and it was just kind of open like this with its innards spewing out like that, and I thought, man, this is really cool. I've never really opened up an inside of a CFL bulb. I know that it's got some electronics inside, but there's quite a bit of nice little cool things happening in there. Luckily, none of the glass broke. You can see it's all intact here, and we all know that inside there's a mixture of argon and mercury. Now, of course, mercury, bad, uh, poisonous, but the concentrations are so low, and they've gotten even lower over the years. Your thermometer has way more mercury than than what you have in here. But that being said, we always want to be careful. You definitely, you know, want to try and avoid breaking this. Now, I don't know if this bulb is good or bad. You know, we can uh, look at a few things along the way. And just taking kind of like an initial look here. Let's see what we got. I'm just kind of moving these out of the way. Uh, looks like two electrolytic capacitors right there. These are these uh, canister looking things. And oh, Definitely an inductor here in the form of a toroid. And then on either side right here, these black things are transistors. So that tells me right there, if this circuit board is good and the bulb is bad, well, now you've got a really cool high voltage uh, switching power source here. That's pretty neat. There are a variety of other capacitors here. See these little green guys? There are quite a few of them. There's one, two, three, four five of them and then taking a closer look here you can see these black let's see if i can find an easier way to point these little black kind of bracelet bead looking things these are your diodes and of course their job is to keep your signal moving in one direction or your current moving in one direction and then here we have uh, a resistor and there's quite a few other resistors hiding in there so those are the main components of what I see and of course this big guy here our transformer and you can see the copper uh, wiring on either side of that and that's pretty interesting but I don't know it's all kind of compact in there let's take a, a closer look here and I'm going to do this without hopefully breaking the the glass and that's you know famous last words so this will allow us to take a little bit of a closer look here and all right well now i'm not using this for sure that's it's over now <laughs> so let's see here here's we have our base and of course this plugs into our socket and we have our two lines and of course this is receiving ac power and you can see that on this black wire here, I'm gonna turn this around, you can see it's got a little bit of a bulge, almost like a snake that ate something and then you can see that bulge in its body. Yeah, kind of gross, but <laughs> that's what it is. That's actually a fuse right there. Now, sometimes you'll find the fuse inside the wire like this, or other times you're gonna find it on the circuit board itself. So if you look really closely, you can find like a glass little tube looking thing. That's your uh, fuse. But right now, for our purposes, this is just located on this black wire here. So typically the way these bulbs work, this circuit is pretty much divided into two parts. So the AC power comes in, it hits the circuit board, and one of the first thing that happens is it goes through some rectifier diodes. Now, of course, diodes will make sure that signal only travels or current in one direction. So AC current, well, that travels in both directions. Your AC power gets turned into DC. So after that, it goes through some capacitors to help uh, manage uh, the voltage, and then the probably the most important thing that it hits is your transformer and your transformer steps up the voltage to about 600 volts that's crazy and once that happens of course that continues to flow to your bulb and if you look at the pins here 
these two little tiny pins and there's a tiny little wire that is connected to them and it winds around and goes to the anode and cathode of your bulb. And once that voltage hits, well, inside the argon and the mercury become excited. All of a sudden there's a rave going on and those electrons start moving really fast. Everybody is like raving, glow sticks, all of that. And it causes the mercury to emit ultraviolet light. Now, of course, we can't see ultraviolet light. What's the point? You know, that's not really helping us in the, you know, illuminating of the room situation. Well, if you look inside the bulb here, you see that it's white and that coating is actually on the inside. It's a phosphor coating. So once the UV light hits it, then it too starts to get excited. Finally, they get into the party and they emit visible light and that's what causes the bulb to glow. So kind of in a nutshell, that's how the signal passes from the wall AC through and then to the bulb to create that light. But let's see here if I'm talking a big game about, yeah, my bulb is good. I know it's good. Uh, well, let's just make sure, right? So say you have a bulb that isn't working. It's burnt out. And so now is it the circuit board or is it the bulb itself? So let's take a look. And I have my multimeter here set to continuity right there so we should hear an audible kind of like beep i'm going to sit this up here and see if we have continuity yep so this side of the bulb works let's check the other side and that works too now hadn't i destroyed this thing already uh, i could probably just put it back into commission close it up real good maybe put uh, some tape around it or my own uh, version of a sealant. Let's see if we can now remove the bulb and separate the uh, the circuit board because oftentimes there's you know goodies underneath and these are really cool to salvage uh, because there's a lot of things that are tougher to find that you can use for other electronic projects. There we go. So we have the circuit board free, free at last. So turning mine around Bam, 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 nothing. It's got a whole bunch of nothing for me right there. Oftentimes you can find more diodes here, sometimes more resistors. And so anytime that you're taking one of these things apart, I like to harvest and keep as many things as possible because say you have another bulb that just stops working and you test the bulb and it's good like mine, it could be something in your circuit board. So if you've kept components from another circuit board, well, you can put your uh, light back to work. I know it tried to take a nap on you, but we don't allow that here. Now, if your bulb weren't working, some of the things that you notice right away, especially with the bulb component, is you'll see some black here. And you already know, like, mm, this is probably not going to go so well. Uh, also, sometimes you'll see a yellowing in the sealer here. Uh, and then you know that perhaps that's most of the time that's heat. And then it starts heating things up. And your electronics, well, we all know electronics don't like a lot of heat. One of the things I like to look for in the electronics to figure out what we're going to harvest, what we're not going to harvest, is just the look of them. Like with these electrolytic capacitors, oftentimes if they're not good, you can tell because they'll be like, a nasty bulge. Sometimes there'll be like a crack coming down the side, but these look really good. Very good for the pickings, you know? And so does this uh, transformer here and the rest of these capacitors. Now, in order to test this, I'm going to remove them all from the board just by uh, desoldering all of these connections. So if you're trying to troubleshoot your board, another thing I like to do is just to kind of gently, gently uh, wiggle each of the components to see if anyone wiggles like a, a loose tooth. They should all be pretty firm, which in my case, that's, that's what's going on here. So all the rest of them, other than this electrolytic capacitor, seem to be on here pretty tight. Now, this is a component that's fun to kind of harvest because you can make other Jewel Thief style projects, your inductor right there, and also your transistors. These are great for projects. There are two portions to this circuit. Rather than trying to explain how these two circuits work, how they talk to each other in something that looks like a tiny little alien city. I figure probably easier to see this on a wiring diagram. So I dug one up and while we look at that, I'm actually gonna go set up and get the soldering iron all warmed up so I can get these components off for the next episode. 
I still haven't figured out what brand my bulb is. So here's a popular wiring diagram you can find online of a Luxar 11 watt CFL bulb. We don't have to go over every component, but I wanted to point out some of the key players. The supply portion consists of a fuse labeled F1, an interference suppressor, that's the inductor labeled L2, those rectifier diodes I talked about earlier that gets the signal moving in one direction, and a filtering capacitor labeled C4. Because it's polarized, you know it's an electrolytic capacitor. The major players in the starting portion of the circuit are diode one, capacitor two, resistor six, and a diac. A diac is a bidirectional semiconductor switch that can be turned on in both forward and reverse polarities above a certain voltage. The letters stand for diode AC switch. Through these components, the signal reaches the base of transistor Q2 and causes it to open. This effort discharges the C2 capacitor so the diac can no longer reopen. Once at the transformer, TR1, the voltage gets stepped up to over 600 volts in preparation to light the bulb for the first time. In this diagram, the transformer consists of a ferrite core indicated by the dashed line with three windings. Finally, C3 discharges and the light bulb turns on. With the starting portion done, diode one blocks this section out. During normal operation, the bulb needs less voltage, so C6 now takes over. For next time, I'll have all these components loose. We can look at them in more detail. We can see how you test them, figure out which ones are good, which ones are bad, so you can use the good ones for future electronic projects. So if there's anything else that you'd like me to tear down, maybe there's something in the house that you've always wondered what's inside, let me know. Hit me up on the website, on social media, and I'll see if I can find a good victim for us.